Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India. Good evening, welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Uzma Jafri. Here are the top stories we are tracking for you on Friday, the 4th of June. Markets reopen in India's financial capital as COVID-19 second wave subsides. Top peace official Abdullah says political division will cause collapse in Afghanistan. And Nepali farmers elated over early monsoon despite pandemic woes. And now for all the details. India on Friday reported 132,364 new coronavirus infections over the last 24 hours, taking the tally of infections in the country to 28.6 million while Mumbai moved towards reopening on Friday as the second wave of COVID-19 began to subside in the country's financial capital, migrant workers are returning to New Delhi as lockdown and coronavirus-related restrictions have started to ease in the Indian capital. Mumbai moved towards reopening on Friday as the second wave of COVID-19 began to subside in the country's financial capital. India's western Maharashtra state and its capital city of Mumbai has been one of the worst affected by the second wave of coronavirus in the country and it was the first state to undergo strict lockdown-like restrictions during the second wave that started in April. Shops would be open in Mumbai on an odd-even basis and administration has also allowed them to run for four more hours from morning 7 a.m. till 2 p.m. local time. Clear. The second wave of coronavirus also prompted India's central bank to cut India's growth predictions as countries reaches Maharashtra was under strict restrictions for nearly two months. Meanwhile, migrant workers are returning to New Delhi as lockdown and coronavirus-related restrictions started to ease in the Indian capital, which saw one of the worst surges in the world. New Delhi went into lockdown on April 20, but new cases have declined in recent weeks, pushing for an unlock that began from May 31 with resuming construction activities. <laughs> Meanwhile, India reported on Friday 132,364 new coronavirus infections over the last 24 hours, while deaths rose by 2,730. The tally of infections now stands at 28.6 million. In news from Pakistan, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan on Friday said the opposition parties are calling on the army to topple his government to protect their interests. His remarks came a day after the main opposition parties vowed to not let the federal budget pass in the parliament. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan on Friday said the opposition parties, whose leaders are self-proclaimed Democrats, are calling on the army to topple his government. Addressing an event in capital Islamabad, Khan said that multi-party opposition alliance Pakistan Democratic Movement is trying to protect their own interests as they have kept their money abroad and are scared the government will take action against them. He said within days of assuming government, the opposition and media started cautioning his naya or new Pakistan phenomena and also made notions about the government's failure. But the bad days were over, he said. फौज को बुला रहे हैं कि फौज आगे गवर्नमेंट गिरा दे अपने आप को डेमोक्रेटिक मूवमेंट कहते हैं फौज को कह रहे हैं कि गवर्नमेंट गिरा दो क्योंकि उनका सरों का मकसद अपने इंटरेस्ट प्रोटेक्ट करना है 
Khan's remarks came a day after the opposition PMLN party in a pre-budget seminar presented a dismal picture of the state of economy in Pakistan due to failed fiscal policies of Ibran Khan led PTI government the main opposition parties including the PMLN and PPP have announced they will not let the federal budget pass during the next session of the parliament from 5th to 30th of June more on news from Pakistan a Pakistani court on Thursday overturned the death sentence of a Christian couple in a blasphemy case, acquitting them for lack of evidence after they had spent seven years on death row. Pakistan's blasphemy laws have long been criticized by global rights groups. Pakistan's Lahore High Court on Thursday overturned the death sentence of a Christian couple in a blasphemy case, acquitting them for lack of evidence after they had spent seven years on death row. A lower court had sentenced Shafkat Emanuel, a watchman at a factory, and his wife, Shah Gufta Kosar, to death in 2014 for allegedly sending derogatory remarks about the Muslim prophet Muhammad in a text message to another man, Khalid Maksud. Insulting the Prophet carries a mandatory death penalty in the predominantly Muslim country. Pakistan's blasphemy laws have long been criticized by global rights group. The country is often hit by vigilante violence against people accused of blasphemy. Rights group Amnesty International said in a statement, the decision puts an end to the seven-year-long ordeal of a couple who should not have been convicted nor faced a death sentence in the first place calling on authorities to provide security to the couple and their lawyer. The acuted couple was named in European Union Parliament resolution passed in April that called for stripping the trade exemptions given by the bloc to Pakistan's exports, saying the country had failed to stem rising blasphemy accusations. In news from Afghanistan, Top Afghan peace official Abdullah Abdullah has said there are serious differences between political leaders in Afghanistan and the system will collapse if they do not forge a consensus on the issues of national importance. The statement came as violence has continued unabated in parts of the country while peace talks with the Taliban have stalled. Head of Afghanistan's High Council for National Reconciliation, Abdullah Abdullah, on Thursday said that there are serious differences between Afghan political leaders and the system will collapse if they do not forge a consensus on the issues of national importance. Speaking during an event in Kabul, Abdullah called on political leaders to put aside their differences and work for the peace process. The statement came as the Afghan government has so far failed to form the much-anticipated state Supreme Council over disagreements on the authority of the council. Meanwhile, violence has continued unabated in parts of the country. At least four civilians, including two women, were killed when a bomb blew up a passenger van in capital Kabul on Thursday, while two blasts on buses in an area dominated by Shiite Muslim Hazaras killed at least 12 people and wounded 10 on Tuesday. Fighting between government forces and Taliban insurgents has also been going on since early May, since the US forces began drawdown from Afghanistan. The UN said last month that nearly 1,800 civilians were killed or wounded in the first three months of 2021 in the clashes, despite efforts to find peace. Moving on to news from Sri Lanka. Sri Lankan authorities are preparing for an oil spill from a sunken container ship MV Express Pearl in the seas off Colombo Harbour that could harm the island's marine environment for years to come. So far, no sign of oil spills have been reported. The government has said it would seek redress for the incident. Sri Lanka on Friday braced for the possibility of an oil spill after MV Express Pearl cargo ship laden with chemicals sank off its western coast in what is already the country's worst ever man-made environmental disaster. The ship's operators, Express Feeders, said in a statement that there were still no signs of any of the 350 tons of a fuel oil had leaked from the ship and that much of the toxic cargo had been incinerated in the fire. But photos from the country's Coast Guard showed a layer of green film blanketing the ocean surrounding the vessel. And billions of plastic pellets have already fouled surrounding beaches 
and fishing grounds, forcing the government to ban fishing along an 80-kilometer stretch of coast. The Singapore registered MV Express Pearl was anchored off the port city of Negombo when a fire erupted on board after an explosion on May 20. The ship, which was only four months, began to sink early on Wednesday. A salvage crew tried to tow the vessel to deeper water away from the coast, but the attempt was abandoned after the rear of the ship touched the seabed. In news from Nepal, farmers in Nepal are highly elated as they have been blessed with early monsoon this year, which in turn has helped them in early plantation of their crops despite the Himalayan nation fighting the second wave of coronavirus. The onset of pre-monsoon climatic effect has put on smiles on the face of Nepali farmers as they are now getting to plant their crops early this year. Farmers in Sanku area on Thursday came together to sing Rupin Geet or plantation songs in the fields as they shared their sorrows, grief and excitement for the farming season. Despite the ongoing pandemic-induced lockdown, early rainfall has ensured availability of water for agriculture in slopes in outskirts of capital Kathmandu. Plantation of paddy saplings in the field called Rupin is of high significance for farmers in Nepal, which is primarily dominant during monsoon season, which starts from June. The Nepal's Meteorological Forecasting Division said monsoon set off in the country from 1st of June and will continue for about three months. Almost 80% of the annual rain in Nepal is received during the monsoon. A public charitable trust in southern India is going the extra mile to help battle vaccine hesitancy by distributing free food and gifts to draw the people to the vaccine centre and encourage them to get the COVID-19 doses. The number of beneficiaries has shot up by eight times since the organisation came up with the reward scheme. A public charitable trust in India's southern Chennai city is distributing free food and gifts to draw the people to the vaccine centres and encourage them to get the COVID-19 doses. The organisation is providing free food including popular spicy rice dish biryani, masks, sanitizers, and many other gift hampers to attract the residents. Sundar, a member of the organisation, said they were planning to gift a gold coin and a moped through a lucky draw to some beneficiaries for getting vaccinated every week. On a longer run, we think that the vaccination is the main agenda. But people started afraiding due to some unwanted social media circulation. So we discussed how to attract the people and to get the work done. So we, we had a discussion with CN Ramdas Trust and Siraj Trust with the, with, the, with the bumper price and all the biryanis concept, recharge concept. They, they, they said, let's, let's straight away go with that. So I'm very happy to get my first shot today. And uh, they are giving a free gifts and um, <clears throat> some bumper prizes and all. So people, please come forward to get your vaccination without any hesitation. The number of beneficiaries has shot up by eight times since the organization came up with the reward scheme. India has been inoculating its people with the AstraZeneca vaccine produced locally at the Serum Institute of India and co-vaccine made by local firm Bharat Biotech and has begun rolling out Russia's Sputnik V. India's vaccination drive as of Friday crossed 224 million mark of administered doses. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now our viewers can watch the show on SouthAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash SAsianewsline and follow us on Twitter at SAsianewsline. 
That's all in tonight's edition. We will see you same time next week. Have a great weekend. Good night. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.